Be she the lahel on boiled word, be or grahul ing is on. Grail we brought she shall love merlow, studio till there's no golly. was turning into a riot as more and more Catholic youths began to shower the security forces with stones, petrol bombs and other missiles. The troops opened fire, the crowd scattered. Thirteen Catholics dead, another seventeen wounded. As the shock of it all began to take hold, it wasn't long before that sad day became known as Bloody Sunday. It is obvious that in the present conditions, the Northern Ireland government can no longer govern. Oh, <coughs> Devlin arrived in London a few years ago at the extraordinary age of 21, elected to Parliament as a Catholic living in North Ireland. Her maiden speech caused a sensation. And there were those who began to write of her as Joan of Arc, whose mission was to unite Ireland. My own opinion of the solution is that we create the Republic of James Conway. Now she is not, she says, a Catholic in any conventional sense. She does not, she says, believed that annexation of the North by the South would itself accomplish anything. She did not want to keep, she said, the key to the city of New York that John Lindsay had given her, which she handed over to the Black Panthers with whom she professed solidarity. In the election of 1960 and with the world around us, the question is whether the world will exist half slave or half free. We recognize in the possibility you have thus given us the reaffirmation by the members of this house and the great Irish people whom you represent of your complete rejection of the apartheid crime against humanity. People should understand the limits to what they can demand in the system. Well, do you remember who said that? It could have been President Nixon arguing against pressing the Soviet Union to grant human rights to its own people in return for most favored nation treatment. But no, that was Herb Stein. As long as the dogs were biting little black babies and black, and black women and black children, Kennedy never thought of sending any troops into Birmingham. at the window and try to hit people with them. And there was stone, and while we was in school, there was stone glass at black people and little kids. You said there it was so that this happened a long time ago in New York. Was this when you were a child? When I was a child, like from, from I moved, so I was born here and then I moved to the States and I moved back here when I was five. And from five years old, things like that were regular enough, yeah. Um, and I, I remember once I was like, about 15 and I was in town with my boyfriend at the time we were I don't know in the city centre somewhere and we were just walking and we just heard an ear da, 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 the N word da, da, da. and uh, I was just non unfazed because I mean I got that a lot and he, it, it was his reaction that I really remember he was just like Jesus Emma like this is this is so awful like are you all right and I was just like this is standard this happens a lot. Boston is famous for a lot of great things, but it also has had a reputation as one of the most racist cities in America. The series is called Boston Racism Image Reality. 
and I'm joined now by one of the reporters on that series, Akila Johnson. Welcome to the News Hour. Thanks for having me. So the very first line of your series reads, Google the phrase, most racist city and Boston pops up more than any other place time and time again. So you guys set out to examine whether or not Boston, in fact, deserves this racist reputation. How do you go about measuring racism? Well, I mean, you, you tackle it from a variety of different angles, right? So in addition to anecdotal um, kind of evidence, the stories that people tell of their lived experience, you begin to kind of look at different data streams that really talk about the disparities in wealth and power in the city. So we're looking at you know, who um, sits in the seats of power on corporate boardrooms and college classrooms. We're looking at um, admittance patterns at, at hospitals, um, just kind of a wide variety of things that can really kind of provide some, some data-driven uh, analysis to this issue. How do you stop economic nationalism morphing into something that is essentially racist? I don't think economic nationalism has anything to do with racism. The white workers of this country are not racist. The neo-Confederates, the neo-Nazis, the KKK have no have no place in uh, have no place in American society. But you know how to harness their anger too, don't you? You've worked out a way to try and separate yourself and your views from them, but at the same time, their comments filled the Breitbart website. You know first, no, to, no, no, the you know no, no, the you anger, you're missing the point. The, ang that the anger, anger, no, that oh, anger is about like economic, like that anger is about the $880 billion to the $4.5 trillion. It's about the wealth. What it's about is a set of elite that took care of themselves and basically screwed over the American worker and the American middle class. The, the anger comes because people are rational. The workers in this country are finally standing up for themselves. And it doesn't matter how many liberal journalists come in here and say, oh, this is a bunch of fascists, this is a bunch of Nazis, this is a bunch of racists. This movement's not going to stop. We shall overcome, we shall overcome, we shall overcome someday. Oh, deep in my heart, I do believe we shall overcome someday. Yeah. 